Today I'm in Central Park and I'm excited to chat with Stephanie O'Connell, who is one of the most popular personal finance writers writing today. She focuses on money and relationships and money mindset, and I'm extremely excited for the conversation. So Stephanie, who are you? It's a really loaded question, right? <laughs> we contain multitudes. Yes. So I'm a New Yorker, yeah. I'm a writer, yep. I'm a speaker, I'm a wife, I'm yep. a runner, yeah. all the things. So you grew up in the suburbs of New York City. When did you move into the city and why? My family came and immigrated to the United States having you know, fled Ukraine and the Soviet Union in the Second yeah. World War. Yeah. And so my mom grew up here and her American dream was to get into the suburbs and to buy a house with land. And yep. that's where I grew up. Yeah. My American dream was to get back into New York. Yeah. So when I applied for college, I applied in New York City. It, and so I have been here since I was 18. So that means at this point, I've lived most of my life in New York City. And did you always want to be an entrepreneur or a writer? Or what was that mm. sort of early, mid-20s, you know? Did Identity you always... crisis, quarter-life yeah, crisis? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where did you start? I mean, what did you want to be? And then, you know, how did that transition you know, into you becoming mm. Stephanie O'Connell. So I wanted to work in the arts. Okay. I graduated college and I went on a tour of a musical. Yeah. Meaning you're in a musical and you're traveling around the country? Yeah, I means? flew to the Philippines okay. three weeks after I graduated college. Okay. And I was on a tour of Cinderella the Musical oh. starring Leia Salonga, who is the voice of Disney Prince's Jasmine and Mulan. Okay. So that was my first job. Wow. And I did that for, I think it was eight months, nine months, and then the recession hit. Okay. Oh, so wait. Yep. I didn't make a lot of money. I made about $450 a week. Okay. But I banked all of it. Okay. I didn't touch it because I lived on the per diem. Sure. The tour ends, and I had $12,000 in the bank. Cool. Which was, to me, an enormous amount yeah, of money. Yeah, 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 absolutely. At 22. Right. Bad news is 2008 recession, first thing to go is like anything discretionary. Sure. Entertainment, sure. the arts, right. basically what my life was. Yeah. Come 2009, yeah. I'm an unemployed artist in the height of a recession. Mm -hmm. My next job offer was for $225 a week. Yeah. No living expenses. And I was like, oh, that's not viable. Sure. I start seeing that $12,000 I banked just dwindle, 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 dwindle sure. so fast. Yeah. I was like at the mercy of my money. Mm -hmm. I, what I could do, what I couldn't do. And I was like, this sucks. Sure. Because I believed the millennial dream. Yep. Pursue your passion. Right. It'll work itself out. Yeah. But I think it's more complicated than that. I think we were all kind of under that delusion in the pre-08 years. Sure. Yeah. And then it was a rough awakening. So how did you transition into entrepreneurship? How did you go from the $250 a week offer into starting to create money content? So I started writing about my own experience. Okay. And I feel like this is a common theme in the money world yep. is we write and talk from a place of mm -hmm. our own personal pain. Sure. And sharing what are the circumstances I'm in? Mm -hmm. And how can I not be in these circumstances? And let me share my own journey. Mm -hmm. And so as I started doing that, I realized, wow, there's a world of this. There is a world of online media. I had never heard of a blog before then. And yep. I think we need to contextualize this. Like, oh wait, there is no Instagram. Correct. I didn't have a smartphone at right. this point in my right. life. The world of online entrepreneurship as we know it didn't mm -hmm. exist to me. Sharing my own experience started as an exercise of accountability. Okay. But it's evolved many, many, many times. Right. So I go from accountability to seeing that there's a broader community, mm -hmm. seeing that there's interest and need, to thinking, oh, I have something to say. We need content for people who don't necessarily have a steady paycheck, right. who maybe graduated into a recession where they struggled for years to find a job, right. where they don't get a 401k through their employer, right. and they can't just take that standard step-by-step -step advice that we've all been accustomed to hearing. And that's where I thought I can bring my perspective because I've lived this. Sure. And knowing that that was a piece of the landscape that I felt was missing at the time, mm -hmm. I saw opportunity. So now, you know, that you've been, say, writing about money for the last, you know, 13 years, yeah. how has your money mindset changed over time? I think early on, when I wasn't making a lot of money, everything was about how I could spend less to make ends meet. Sure. 
And I think that's important at that stage. Right. Right. How can I cut back? How can I make these ends meet? How can I make this work? But as I started blogging and broadening out into the broader scope of entrepreneurship, yep. I just saw what a powerful lever income could be mm -hmm. and just the unlimited nature of income potential as opposed to cutting back on expenses, which is inherently limited. Sure. And as I saw that the kind of income that would facilitate the lifestyle I could only dream about before right. Right. was actually accessible to me, Cool. that changed everything. I want to move into some of the stuff you've been writing and creating now around ambition is not hustle culture. Can, can you explain what that means to you and, and why you've moved into this new phase of work? What I've stumbled upon is just that like I'm an incredibly ambitious person and I know a lot of people who feel similarly. But I am really good at doing nothing too. Mm -hmm. And I don't see those two things being in conflict. Yep. But the way that narrative has been positioned is to be ambitious means to work nonstop, to right. rise and grind, right. to, you know, Beyonce has 24 hours in the day just like you. Right. Like, the, people actually say that. Oh my gosh, people say <laughs> That's that. That's terrible. Yeah. I have always found that to, one, be a narrative that just doesn't seem sustainable. Mm -hmm. I think in a season of life, there is time of more hustle than others. And yeah. I acknowledge that it has a place and a purpose, but I think the way it's talked about as an imperative mm -hmm. for achieving ambition and having any kind of success, I think is turning to a point of toxicity. Sure. And people are burning out and yep. we're seeing that happening. Yeah in mass, right? right? This is not a sustainable model, right. especially now that we can be connected to our work at all times. Right. Hustle now means working 24 seven. seven. And yeah. that is not working. How about let's take a minute to talk about mm -hmm. and reimagine what it means to have a lot of ambition without that. I love that. And I love your thoughts on the CEO and the female entrepreneur space on social. What is happening there? <laughs> in your opinion. This is something I have had a personal reckoning with because yeah. I bought into it. I wanted that. This CEO boss babe culture yeah. was happening at the same time I was building my business. Yeah. And like there was part of it that spoke to me. Mm -hmm. But what's happened is like we're selling the dream mm -hmm. and we're not confronting the reality with it. And that's where it becomes a problem. I don't have a problem with the dream. Yeah. But is the dream being used as cover for exploitation? This is part of a much longer arc, right? Mm -hmm. I am a 1980s baby, which yep. means I was part of the original cohort of Take Your Daughter to Work Day yeah. in the 90s. This was the idea of third wave feminism, I think, yep. at least like middle yep. class white feminism in the yeah. 90s was like, yep. the way to get to gender equity is we are gonna take these little girls, yeah. we're gonna fill them full of power, girl power. Right. I'll tell you what I want, what I really, really want. Right. Right? Right. And then by the time <laughs> they're in the workforce, We'll have it. We'll have it. We'll have parents. Sure. I'm 35 and yeah. guess what? Yeah. Nothing has changed. Yeah. When you look at the numbers of pay equity, mm -hmm. if you look at leadership, if you look at unpaid labor and the division in the household, those numbers haven't budged in a decade. And that is a tragedy. Yeah. And so what that tells me is that girl power doesn't work yep. and neither does boss babe. Yeah. What works is probably some policy changes, yep. probably really interrogating some of the bias and discrimination we're seeing. I think we just need to really confront the reality of what's going on in the world. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. So let's switch into money and relationships. Can you talk a little bit about how you manage money with your partner? Mm, where should I start? Let's start on when you first started dating mm. and you know, did you have a higher net worth? Were you making more money? How did those initial money conversations go? When my now yeah, husband and yeah. I first started dating, uh, he was making more money than I was. Mm -hmm. And I had a feeling that was true, but I didn't know, you know, it's like you're feeling everything out 
at the beginning. You don't ask these things explicitly. But one thing that I was doing at the time was starting my blog. That process of sharing online had made me a little bit more transparent in my day to day so that I wasn't coming to the first date like, what's your debt load and what's your credit score? (laughs) But when he asked me out, I said, I don't care what we do as long as it's cheap because I'm on a budget. Yeah. So it's like, I'm sending a signal that Mm -hmm. I talk about this stuff, even if I'm not interrogating you about what's in your bank account. And that really set a precedent for everything that came after Mm -hmm. that. I am a big believer that there is no one right way to do Mm -hmm. anything. So what I do is I use a framework of expectations, Mm -hmm. rules, and goals. And I think if you can come together on those things, then you have a lot of flexibility without creating a situation of financial infidelity or doing something that a partner feels betrayed by. So what I mean by expectations is setting an expectation of how much we will respectively Mm -hmm. contribute to our household expenses. In my relationship, that looks like a shared checking account. And there is an expectation at the beginning of every month, each person puts in $2,000. Okay. If that expectation is met, you can do whatever else you want with the money. There's also an expectation around what are our broader goals. Mm -hmm. We each have our own retirement accounts. We try to max those out. My husband has a 401k. Yep. Okay, he has this many pay periods to max it out. He's gonna try to do that. We split things evenly because we make roughly the same amount of money, Mm -hmm. but I'll tell you, that has not always been the case. My husband lost his job for 18 months during the pandemic. And that's why I say the same system that works for you at a certain point in your relationship might not work in a year. And so, I am always very flexible and I like a framework that allows for that flexibility. Now I said rules. Yeah. Well, what's a rule? A rule is I'm not going to lend money to somebody without discussing it with my husband. Okay. Yeah. I am not going to spend a certain amount without checking in. Yeah. So it's creating a rule or a boundary. Yeah. I love that. And then a goal. Like what's Mm -hmm. the thing we're working toward? Yeah. I've been interviewing a lot of people on my podcast about money and relationships and they're having a lot of struggle talking about it because it's all about like the negative experience of it that it's uncomfortable that this person makes so much more or like we can't divide things 50 50 and there's this obsession with 50 50 that i think is unhealthy and it just becomes such a negative experience because there hasn't been any discussion around what it's for like what are we working towards and you know me i'm not obsessed with outcomes Mm -hmm. but i think having some idea of like what is it i want this money to do for our relationship even if it's on a day-to-day level even if it's dinner on friday night right that makes it a positive experience. Yeah. And so those are the three things that I need to be in place to have a healthy money dialogue with my partner or anybody. You know, I have a business partner too, and right. we have the same kind of rules too. One of the th- rules that I have for new business ventures and partnerships is I don't open a business bank account until the business has made at least $1,000. Oh, that's interesting. So to get to that point, it's almost like a milestone. Yeah. And I found now in one of my newer ventures is that with my two partners having these sort of milestones that we're working towards, it actually took, you know, like eight months for this one thing to make the first thousand dollars. But then that became a real celebratory moment of Mm -hmm. opening the bank account and going through all of that. I kind of love that idea, though, too, like at at a certain milestone that you have a check in. And maybe that's something, again, that you could bring to other relationships. Too. Like right. The strategy we need at $100,000 is not the strategy we need at a million dollars or right. $10 million. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. A number of my friends and just people that I'm around, they have this sort of like deep aching that they're not enough, mm. that somehow, you know, they haven't lived up to whether it was sort of the dream they originally had or the potential that they felt in life. They struggle with really feeling stuck about, gosh, you know, I've been in this career, like being a lawyer for 10 years now, and I put all this effort in, but this really isn't fulfilling me anymore. Their vision of their life just hasn't lived up, you know, to to the life that they wanted. Mm -hmm. And often the only thing to do in that case is to figure out either A, sort of accept, or B, you know, burn it down a little bit and make the big pivot or make the big change. And I see this happen even with people who we think of as traditionally the ones who went 
and pursued their passion and quote unquote made it. Yep. But I, I still find the same pattern by a certain life stage. Where they're like, this isn't the thing that I'm thrilled about. I don't know that I want to keep doing this for sure. the rest of my life, even though it was my dream. Right. So it's okay for the dream to change. We don't have that part of the narrative, right? Yeah. It's like yep. so much about getting mm -hmm. to the dream. And then what? Why can't there be multitudes of yeah. dreams? Yeah. And this is why I'm really into the idea of curiosity over mm -hmm. passion. Yep. Letting ourselves just go out and try some stuff. I think we're just not taught how to exist in the space of not knowing. And that's the thing I see a lot of people, they give up too soon or they adopt someone else's dream as mm. their own. So how do you get comfortable being uncomfortable? I had to learn how to A, recognize that the tools that helped me reach financial independence were no longer going to be useful for me at this phase in my life. I needed to let go of the hustle. I needed to let go of the over-optimization of money. I needed to let go of this sort of somewhat naive version of freedom. Mm. And I needed to get comfortable with realizing that no matter what time was going to move on and I was going to change and I was changing and who I was was changing, but I needed to just give myself the space to let that happen. Because often, at least I found in my own life, the most beautiful things show up when I've just simply created the space for them to show up. And that's one of the things about my next book is I'm thinking about that progression yes. of how do you let go of who you were and who you are to create the space for the you you've yet to become in a way that's graceful and includes self-care mm -hmm. and allows you to operate in, in, in the world in, in a way that makes your life richer and fuller and more meaningful and to help you become the fullest expression of what it means to be a human being. And so that's where my work transitions beyond money. You know, it's hard because I think when we get really into our money, it's obviously a valuable tool, but sometimes it can become an identity. Yeah. And I think it's when it becomes an identity that it becomes really hard to let go when it's time to let go. That's where I'm really cautious, both in how I talk about it and also how I experience it for myself. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for joining this conversation and being so open and vulnerable. I've really have been looking forward to this. It's just been so fun to be on this journey with you and I wish you nothing but success and peace and I'm excited to continue this conversation in the future. Likewise, thank you for having me on. Thank you.